Lesson 1 Paul and the Ephesians Sabbath Afternoon June 24 Paul was a living example of what every true Christian should be. He lived for God's glory. His words come sounding down the line to our time, for to me to live is Christ. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He who was once a persecutor of Christ in the person of his saints now holds up before the world the cross of Christ. Paul's heart burned with a love for souls, and he gave all his energies for the conversion of men. There never lived a more self-denying, earnest, persevering worker. His life was Christ. He worked the works of Christ. All the blessings he received were prized as so many advantages to be used in blessing others. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1112. In the Council of Heaven, provision was made that men, though transgressors, should not perish in their disobedience, but through faith in Christ as their substitute and surety might become the elect of God, predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. God wills that all men should be saved, for ample provision has been made in giving his only begotten Son to pay man's ransom. Those who perish will perish because they refuse to be adopted as children of God through Christ Jesus. Before the foundations of the earth were laid, the covenant was made that all who were obedient, all who should through the abundant grace provided become holy in character and without blame before God by appropriating that grace, should be children of God. This covenant, made from eternity, was given to Abraham 1900 years before Christ came. With what interest and what intensity did Christ in humanity study the human race to see if they would avail themselves of the provision offered? Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1114. All the favors he has shown to his son in his acceptance of the great atonement are shown to his people. Those who have united their interests in love with Christ are accepted in the beloved. They suffered with Christ in his deepest humiliation and his glorification is of great interest to them because they are accepted in him. God loves them as he loves his son. Christ, Emmanuel, stands between God and the believer, revealing the glory of God to his chosen ones and covering their defects and transgressions with the garments of his own spotless righteousness. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1115. Sunday, June 25. Paul, Evangelist to Ephesus As Paul was brought in direct contact with the idolatrous inhabitants of Ephesus, the power of God was strikingly displayed through him. The apostles were not always able to work miracles at will. The Lord granted his servants this special power as the progress of his cause or the honor of his name required. Like Moses and Aaron at the court of Pharaoh, the apostle had now to maintain the truth against the lying wonders of the magicians. Hence the miracles he wrought were of a different character from those which he had heretofore performed. So the scripture declares that the Lord wrought miracles by the hand of Paul, and that the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and not the name of Paul. Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 135 By burning their books on magic, the Ephesian converts showed that the things in which they had once delighted, they now abhorred. It was by and through magic that they had especially offended God and imperiled their souls, and it was against magic that they showed such indignation. Thus they gave evidence of true conversion. These treatises on divination contained rules and forms of communication with evil spirits. 
They were the regulations of the worship of Satan, directions for soliciting his help and obtaining information from him. By retaining these books, the disciples would have exposed themselves to temptation. By selling them, they would have placed temptation in the way of others. They had renounced the kingdom of darkness, and to destroy its power, they did not hesitate at any sacrifice. Thus truth triumphed over men's prejudices and their love of money. By this manifestation of the power of Christ, a mighty victory for Christianity was gained in the very stronghold of superstition. The influence of what had taken place was more widespread than even Paul realized. From Ephesus, the news was widely circulated and a strong impetus was given to the cause of Christ. Long after the apostle himself had finished his course, these scenes lived in the memory of men and were the means of winning converts to the gospel. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 288 and 289. We have an influence, a powerful influence in the world. We are to have an eye single to the glory of God. We are to work with all the intelligence that God has given us, placing ourselves in the channel of light, that the grace of God can come upon us to mold and fashion us to the divine similitude. Heaven is waiting to bestow its richest blessings upon those who will consecrate themselves to do the work of God in these last days of the world's history. God's Amazing Grace, page 272. Monday, June 26. A Riot in the Amphitheater. In his speech, Demetrius had said, This our craft is in danger. These words reveal the real cause of the tumult at Ephesus and also the cause of much of the persecution which followed the apostles in their work. Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen saw that by the teaching and spread of the gospel, the business of image-making was endangered. The income of pagan priests and artisans was at stake, and for this reason they aroused against Paul the most bitter opposition. The decision of the recorder and of others holding honorable offices in the city had set Paul before the people as one innocent of any unlawful act. This was another triumph of Christianity over error and superstition. God had raised up a great magistrate to vindicate his apostle and hold the tumultuous mob in check. Paul's heart was filled with gratitude to God that his life had been preserved and that Christianity had not been brought into disrepute by the tumult at Ephesus. The Acts of the Apostles, page 295. Paul as well as laboring publicly, went from house to house, preaching repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He met with men at their homes and besought them with tears, declaring unto them the whole counsel of God. Jesus came in personal contact with men. He did not stand aloof and apart from those who needed his help. We must come close to the hearts of those who need our ministry. We must open the Bible to the understanding, present the claims of God's law, read the promises to the hesitating, urge the backward, arouse the careless, strengthen the weak. Do not neglect speaking to your neighbors and doing them all the kindness in your power. We need to seek for the spirit that constrained the Apostle Paul to go from house to house, pleading with tears and teaching repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Reflecting Christ, page 245. There are a thousand temptations in disguise prepared for those who have the light of truth, and the only safety for any of us is in receiving no new doctrine no new interpretation of the scriptures without first submitting it to brethren of experience. Lay it before them in a humble, teachable spirit with earnest prayer, and if they see no light in it, yield to their judgment. Satan is constantly at work, but few have any idea of his activity and subtlety. The people of God must be prepared to withstand the wily foe. It is this resistance that Satan dreads. He knows better than we do the limit of his power and how easily he can be overcome if we resist and face him. 
Through divine strength, the weakest saint is more than a match for him and all his angels, and if brought to the test, he would be able to prove his superior power. Therefore, Satan's step is noiseless, his movements stealthy, and his batteries masked. He does not venture to show himself openly, lest he arouse the Christian's dormant energies and send him to God in prayer. Maranatha, page 60. Tuesday, June 27. Hearing the letter to the Ephesians. The Apostle, Paul, continues that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. While this divine fullness has been placed within our reach, how easily we are satisfied. We have accustomed ourselves to think that it is enough to have a knowledge of the truth without its sanctifying power. Just a little sip at the fountain of life quenches our thirst. We do not come again and again to drink. But this is not in accordance with the mind of God. Our soul should be continually athirst for the water of life. Our heart should ever go out after Christ, longing for communion with Him. It is hungering and thirsting after righteousness that will bring us the full measure of His grace. How did Enoch gain this sweet intimacy? It was by having thoughts of God continually before him. As he went out and as he came in, his meditations were upon the goodness, the perfection, and the loveliness of the divine character. And as he was thus engaged, he became changed in the glorious image of his Lord. For it is by beholding that we become changed. The Signs of the Times, August 18, 1887 it is not only the privilege, but the duty of every Christian to maintain a close union with Christ and to have a rich experience in the things of God. Then his life will be fruitful in good works. Said Christ, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. John chapter 15 verse 8 When we read the lives of men who have been eminent for their piety, we often regard their experiences and attainments as far beyond our reach. But this is not the case. Christ died for all, and we are assured in His Word that He is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. The prophets and apostles did not perfect Christian character by a miracle. They used the means which God had placed within their reach and all who will put forth the same effort will secure the same results. In his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul sets before them the mystery of the gospel, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19, the unsearchable riches of Christ, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, and then assures them of his earnest prayers for their spiritual prosperity. The Sanctified Life, pages 83 and 84. Wednesday, June 28, Ephesians in its time. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 24. Many take it for granted that they are Christians simply because they subscribe to certain theological tenets. But they have not brought the truth into practical life. They have not believed and loved it. Therefore, they have not received the power and grace that come through sanctification of the truth. Men may profess faith in the truth, but if it does not make them sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, heavenly-minded, it is a curse to its possessors, and through their influence, it is a curse to the world. The world needs evidences of sincere Christianity. Professed Christianity may be seen everywhere, but when the power of God's grace is seen in our churches, the members will work the works of Christ. Natural and hereditary traits of character will be transformed. 
the indwelling of his spirit will enable them to reveal Christ's likeness and in proportion to the purity of their piety will be the success of their work. God's Amazing Grace, page 263. At times the difficulties that we shall meet will be most disheartening. The very greatness of the task will appall us. And yet with God's help, his servants will finally triumph. Wherefore, my brethren, I desire that ye faint not because of the trying experiences that are before you. Jesus will be with you. He will go before you by his Holy Spirit, preparing the way, and he will be your helper in every emergency. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Life Sketches, page 439 For the believers at Ephesus, the apostle prayed, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 17 to 19. The ministry of the divine spirit in enlightening the understanding and opening to the mind the deep things of God's holy word was the blessing which Paul thus besought for the Ephesian church. The Great Controversy, page 9. Thursday, June 29, Ephesians, a Christ-saturated letter. The Savior longed to unfold to his disciples the truth regarding the breaking down of the middle wall of partition between Israel and the other nations, the truth that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with the Jews and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 and chapter 3 verse 6. Christ sought to teach the disciples the truth that in God's kingdom there are no territorial lines, no caste, no aristocracy, that they must go to all nations bearing to them the message of a Savior's love. But not until later did they realize in all its fullness that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us acts chapter 17 verses 26 and 27 the acts of the apostles pages 19 and 20 this is life eternal, Christ said, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Why is it that we do not realize the value of this knowledge? Why are not these glorious truths glowing in our hearts, trembling upon our lips, and pervading our whole being? In giving us his word, God has put us in possession of every truth essential for our salvation. Thousands have drawn water from these wells of life, yet there is no diminishing of the supply. Thousands have set the Lord before them, and by beholding have been changed into the same image. Their spirit burns within them as they speak of his character, telling what Christ is to them and what they are to Christ. But these searchers have not exhausted these grand and holy themes. Thousands more may engage in the work of searching out the mysteries of salvation. As the life of Christ and the character of his mission are dwelt upon, rays of light will shine forth more distinctly at every attempt to discover truth. Each fresh search will reveal something more deeply interesting than has yet been unfolded. Lift Him Up, page 378 God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, the Apostle Paul writes, through sanctification of the Spirit, and belief of the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 
In this text, the two agencies in the work of salvation are revealed, the divine influence and the strong living faith of those who follow Christ. It is through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth that we become laborers together with God. Christ waits for the cooperation of His Church. He does not design to add a new element of efficiency to His Word. He has done His great work in giving His inspiration to the Word. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Divine Word are ours. The object of all this provision of heaven is before us the salvation of the souls for whom Christ died. And it depends upon us to lay hold on the promises God has given and become laborers together with Him. Divine and human agencies must cooperate in the work. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 22. For further reading, God's Amazing Grace, Source of Right Influence, page 272, and Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, Pray for the Latter Rain, page 508.